So, you know, the, after the sensitivity range in the performance factors, another very important aspect is the accuracy. The sensor accuracy has to be, in most of the cases, uh, better than plus minus 5 percent. So, accuracy also reflects the repeatability or, you know, the kind of uh, parity between the measurements that the sensor ma makes uh, over time if you have multiple readings, okay. Another uh, very important uh, aspect uh, of performance, uh, you know, which has to be kept in mind, it is a kind of intangible aspect is, is the nature of solution or the variety of solution that the sensor can scan. Uh, so, when you design the sensor, uh, a very important aspect to take care of is that whether the sensor um, can withstand various conditions of pH, temperature, ionic strength, uh, etc. And so, essentially, the sensor, uh, when you talk about designing the sensor, it has to be designed for, uh, you know, its its oper operability, operate, uh, you know, its ability to get operated in varied conditions of different pH, temperature ionic strength, etc. Okay. So, uh, that is another aspect, a performance factor aspect of a particular sensor. Another very important uh, aspect which makes uh, the sensor really give a commercial angle is its performance uh, time or, you know, response time. So, for biosensors typically, the response time has been found out to be uh, a little longer. It takes about 30 seconds or more. In this context, I would also like to say that, you know, in electrochemical sensing operations, this uh, sensor time uh, becomes very, uh, you know, uh, high because of the fact that you have to uh, recondition the electrodes, the sensing electrodes, and that is a very time consuming process. So, that, that essentially, uh, although it is not a part of the actual response time, comes in the overall time of sensing of such an electrode. So, if you are having a real time process where there is a continuous monitoring of the analyte of interest with time, it is a very critical aspect that what is the response time of the sensor, how soon can it process a chemical information into an electrical or otherwise optically readable signal. A very important, another very important aspect, uh, it is also a part of the performance factor is the recovery time of a particular sensor. So, I would like to define this as the time elapsed before the sensor is ready to analyze next sample. Okay. So, essentially it is uh, the time between the readouts. So, if you have two or more uh, certain, you know, readings that you want to take with the same sensor, um, how much amount of reconditioning time is needed so that you can get the sensor ab initio so that uh, the sensing can start on a very accurate basis. So, uh, that, that, that is an important aspect of the performance factor of the sensor. So, if uh, you have a recovery time of more than a minute, more than a few minutes, then really it does not make sense in real time operations anymore. And a very important aspect, another very important aspect is the working lifetime of a sensor, uh, like things like stability of the selective material, uh, uh, you know, uh, it defines these, uh, these kind of issues. In case of glucose sensors, as I was illustrating in my last lecture, uh, this enzyme glucose oxidase is a very uh, a finicky enzyme. It, it can uh, only have a defined shelf life. So, uh, if, if, the, if these kind of moieties, which are essentially recognition elements, they change their behavior with time, what good it is to the sensing aspect. So, the working lifetime is a very important factor that needs to be uh, considered if you want to design good sensors. Let us actually uh, now go to the next uh, level and try to find out that this whole kind of race to miniaturize, uh, you know, starting from uh, let us say uh, the, the microchips, okay. uh, why uh, really it is important? What, is, what are the, some of the reasons for miniaturizing, uh, let us say sensors? Okay. So, the, the justification can be provided by looking at several aspects. One aspect could be that, uh, you know, uh, as we had talked in uh, the, uh, the scales and sizes, the reduction of sensor element to the scale of the target species uh, would actually give a higher sensitivity uh, for detecting a single entity or a molecule. So, it is a very important aspect. So, you are talking about uh, you know the, the particular detecting element to be of the size of a single molecule 
uh, or a single uh, moiety of interest. So, when the size comparison is uh, there, there is automatically a higher sense, uh, sensitivity of detection of, of such a process. Another very interesting uh, aspect is uh, you know reduced reagent volumes and costs of operations. Uh, in, in you know so some time back I was mentioning about this process of polymerase chain reaction where you are artificially trying to amplify a small segment of DNA and uh, you know it is a fascinating process, but unfortunately uh, it is a very expensive process too because it uses uh, some of these chemically isolated base pairs, um, uh, some enzymes you know some, some ionic buffers etcetera which gives the whole reaction cost you know a different dimension altogether. So, therefore, uh, more number of PCR runs essentially is at the cost is, is at a more uh, money spending um, you know issue ok. So, therefore, uh, it is important that if we can design a sensor in a manner which can do a micro PCR that means, you take a small volume where let us say the overall volume is about 1 microliters in nature and then you have these different components which go into the reaction probably of the order of picoliters. So, in that case the cost the overall associated cost reduces. So, one of the reasons why miniaturization is important is uh, that the region volumes uh, used for chemical analysis automatically reduce because of the size factor. Reduce time to results due to small volumes uh, uh, you know uh, is, is a very important aspect. And uh, as we know that when we talk about concentrations of different moieties within a solution, there is an aspect of diffusion which comes into picture automatically. That if you have a gradient of concentration, there is always a tendency of molecules to diffuse and homogenize the particular medium. So, if this overall volume over which we are talking is very small, then the diffusion mechanics is much much more rapidly taking place and as a result of which uh, the homogenization from which the sensing activity would start really. Uh, is much quicker ok. So, this uh, has its effects in terms of response time of the sensor also that miniaturizing a sensor or miniaturizing the volume of fluid which is to be sensed uh, essentially reduces the time to homogenize. So, that you can have an accurate readout much faster. Of course, uh, portability is a major issue uh, these days uh, there is there is a concept of bedside monitoring of a patient wherein uh, we, we also know this whole area as point of care diagnostics, where uh, we take a small sensor uh, to where a patient is and really the sensor does a job, uh, its job on a real time basis uh, just by you know um, just continuously monitoring uh, the patient's health uh, and, and such sensors have to be miniaturized, because otherwise if you move the whole laboratory. Uh, how, how is it possible really. So, the concept of uh, lab on chip really emerged because of the need to make things more portable. So, that they can be more uh, delivered at the point where it is needed essentially. So, amenability to portable of portability um, is a very important aspect why the sensor should be miniaturized. So, point of care diagnostics essentially uh, which we talked about. I would just like to share with you that Nowadays, uh, in advanced uh, healthcare schemes, uh, there are uh, small ring like sensors which they would just put around your finger and they can monitor your uh, uh, things like you know blood glucose level very easily on an optical basis. So, uh, any patient who goes into an emergency care essentially is given such a ring to wear, and uh, the ring has um, a perfectly wirelessly communicating system which would give information about uh, you know uh, the content or, or the hemoglobin uh, the, uh, the glucose content of the patient from time to time ok. So, this is point of care uh, this comes very close to where uh, the patient is placed actually and thus its job on a continuous basis. Miniaturization is also helpful for multi agent detection capabilities uh, uh, what essentially it means is that if you have more than one agents that you want to detect and if you really want to detect each agent on a very small basis, you could densely integrate several such detection protocols on a small particular chip and uh, uh, that is the essence of microchip technology essentially that you can on a very dense networked basis do multi agent detection on a very small area. 
and uh, the very important last but not the least uh, why miniature registration is needed at least in some of the reasons which appear uh, to be the most prominent ones is uh, is the potential for use in vitro as well as in vivo so for those of you who are new in this area in vitro essentially means outside the human body okay so the sensor can do its job uh, outside the human body uh, in vivo on the other hand is inside the human body so all these real time sensors that uh, we have been illustrating from time to time are essentially in vivo sensors you implant a sensor onto the human body and it keeps on monitoring the health rapidly and it keeps on giving data rapidly so that is an in vivo sensor so miniaturization is very helpful for in vitro as well as in vivo sensing okay so one of the reasons is that if you are talking about an implantable sensor and the sensor is of the size of a pen uh, can you imagine the amount of pain that the patient uh, is inflicted upon if you want to locate the sensor somewhere within his body okay so the smaller the sensor is the better in that case because it can cause a painless delivery of the sensor to the target where uh, it can detect or it can start detecting so uh, again uh, uh, we have been talking about lab on chip devices i guess you have a fairly good idea about what biochips are so let me just definitionally uh you know kind of outlay what this technology is all about so lebon chip is a term for devices that integrate multiple laboratory functions on a single chip so uh, very obvious uh, the definition that you have uh, several functions in a laboratory uh, which uh, are kind of integrated together uh to do some detection so lab on chip is something that brings all these functions to a very small single chip there are enormous applications of lab on chip as on date uh, there are several commercially available protocols too uh, there are applications in medicines pharmacology pharmaceuticals for food safety so on so forth and uh, some of the advantages that such devices offer on a commercial basis is uh, that they are fully integrated and uh, essentially without or maybe with very less i should say human intervention okay so it is a very clean process uh, you don't have chances of contamination uh, just because of multiple handling as happens very often in the laboratory uh, they are highly sensitive uh, in nature because of the miniaturized form of these chips as we have been often on talking about before they are extremely rapid so the time of response is very less because of all those homogenization aspects of the analyte and you know being a small volume the diffusion restrictions are automatically minimized so on and so forth and then this other aspect of cost performance product uh, so essentially these are low cost high performance uh, devices so that's why uh, they are really high utility um, you know, the lavon chips are really a high utility uh, kind of devices okay so some of the companies uh, selling these technologies uh, across Uh, the globe uh, to name a few nanogen uh, caliper technologies affymetrix clara technologies so on so forth and uh, uh, essentially uh, these two companies nanogen and affymetrix um, uh, they 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 are um, selling uh, or catering to the whole um, diagnostics industry uh by selling uh, you know gene identification platforms okay and we'll be discussing in details about these as we go along uh, our lectures as to some of the strategies and uh, mechanisms that these manufacturers use uh, to identify uh, these chemical this the sequence of base pairs on uh, a single dna molecule so in general um there's a known fact that you know if you look at all the commercial applications of all these lab on chip systems more or less uh, uh a majority i would say almost 80 90% of the products which are currently available are in this integrated gene analysis area okay and uh, there are uh, some products which have been developed in the immunology uh, uh, like a clara a clara has a product or uh, this uh, caliper technologies has has a product uh, wherein uh, immunochemistry is used for identification of uh cells or biological moieties so that's in a nutshell what the status of uh, lab on chip techniques are i would now like to illustrate uh, a very important area uh, uh which uh, which has come up off late because of the development of these tools um and this is uh, also known as nanobiology okay 
So the, the MEMS technology, in fact, the miniaturization technology is very useful for studying certain aspects of single cells. Okay. So here in this particular case, as you are seeing, this is a controlled microenvironment in a biochip where you have, um, you know, a, a kind of, um, it's, it's like something like a, let's say a nanowire, okay, between two posts. And uh, you have uh, a silicon platform here. It is like a MOSFET device, okay. So essentially, uh, whatever is going on, in terms of chemical changes in top of this, this region gets converted in terms of a surface potential. And uh, if there is a charge transfer process which is happening in this particular region, the surface potential change would result in a variation in the drain source current in, in the MOSFET device. And so therefore, uh, it can be a very good identification basis for uh, you know, what is going on in a single cell which is immobilized into uh, this area. So you give a stimulus to the cell and see how the cell performs. Now, how is it important? Uh, these, uh, you know, this is very, very uh, interesting um, that actually um, in, the, there is an increased uh, requirement of understanding of the physiology uh, of a single cell in the presence or absence of uh, its, its, you know, um, Identical, uh, identical other cells, uh, and so uh, uh, th there is a lot of signaling mechanism between, uh, let's say, more than one cells growing on a certain area, which results in a totally different behavioral change of uh, a cell of interest. So, cell physiology essentially uh, nowadays focuses on to these uh, molecular events which take place in the presence or absence of a group of other cells. Uh, one more interesting factor is that, you know, the way that proteins are produced and I am going to actually introduce this uh, topic a little bit uh, doing a basic biology that what uh, happens in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a cell, okay. So there is a certain uh, programming aspect of uh, a particular cell uh, which we have to really read uh, if we uh, come to, you know, uh, such, such a mechanism. So, uh, as we know that uh, there is there is this molecular information stored within the the DNA of a particular cell. Okay, so this information is a basis of uh, giving uh, what kind of proteins the cell produces. Okay, this area nowadays is increasingly going because uh, proteins essentially are a very important basis of the state of health of a certain cell. Okay, so there is a uh, there is a process called transcription and translation within single cells and it is a huge nano machinery which is at work. There is a tendency of this messenger RNA uh, which is a compressed code essentially encoding a certain area or region of the gene uh, that we are talking about and this RNA actually comes all the way from the nucleus into the cytoplasm and through the cytoplasm it goes to something called an endoplasmic reticulum which is also the protein warehouse of a cell where there is a coding which happens on this mRNA and uh, the base pairs of mRNA are converged rapidly into a sequence of amino acids which is essentially the protein which is being produced. So this, this is a fantastic process which is going on. So nanobiology again studies very closely these signaling effects within the cells which asks the cell to code a certain region of the gene based on the impulse or the response that it has from an environment. And uh, such studies can only be possible when you make uh, the sensing system doing so, uh, these studies on a very, very highly miniaturized basis, okay. So in a nutshell, uh, what I would like to say is, you know, the increase uh, in uh, this, uh, uh, the, 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 so this, these concepts of miniaturization has resulted into, uh, 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 you know, uh, this, this, this fantastic field of nanobiology to de de get developed, uh, where analysis of single cells and study of their function uh, in real time can be can be accomplished. Uh, there can be an increased understanding of the signaling pathways inside the cell. Some of them we have been mentioning off and on. Uh, basic uh, cell functions such as how the cells differentiate in the presence of uh, absence, presence or absence of its own uh, types around it. Uh, uh, the way they reproduce, okay, uh, the, the way uh, the apoptose or die after a certain time and their implications on various 
disease states uh, they can be understood on a very molecular level and essentially the focus of the post genomic area uh, and systems biology some of these newly emerging fields are in this area uh, more often cut so nanobiology definitely is um, you know probably one of the areas of interest uh, which automatically gets cropped up because of this micro systems technology. So, this uh, pretty much brings us to the end of uh, this lecture and uh, next time we will be uh, seeing how microfabrication tools can be used to realize things which are small and miniaturized which could do some of these jobs that I have been mentioning over the last two lectures. So, uh, probably we will discuss a little bit of microfabrication related processes in our next lecture. Thank you. Thank you.